Hi everyone, Greg here, and welcome to the official Karma Dog YouTube channel, the channel for people who like music and some other stuff. Normally, this is primarily a music channel, but today I'm sharing some cool sciencey stuff just because I think it's interesting. I should mention this is a shorter, more concise version of an earlier video. This new version attempts to show how the scientific method can be used to answer questions about the world around us. This is Lake Michigan. I live about here. It's sort of a little alcove on the western shore. Here's the view. Nice, isn't it? But it sure looks flat. I wonder if it really is, though. Let's try science. There are a few ways to use what we call the scientific method, depending on what website, or even better, what book, you look at. There are a few different descriptions of the scientific method, but they generally look a lot like this. Step one, ask a question. Step two, gather information and observe. This usually means research and making measurements. Step three, make a hypothesis, which means you guess your answer to your question. Step four, experiment and test your hypothesis. Step five, analyze your test results. And step six, present a conclusion. So, step one, let's ask a question. Is the lake flat or curved? Well, let's observe. Looking north, it looks flat. Looking east, looks flat. And looking south, looks awfully flat. And if I take these three different shots and stitch them together, it still looks pretty flat. For the record, this is neither a panorama nor a wide angle shot. I just stitched together four separate shots of the lake. Next, and we're still on step two, gather information and make measurements. Well, I don't have a 10 mile tape measure, or even a 10 mile piece of string, or any land surveying equipment, but what I do have are my eyes, a camera, and I have a computer with Google Earth. So these will have to be my measuring tools. According to Google Earth, the part of the lake that I'm able to see from north to south on this little alcove is about 8.4 miles. I've also got this much coastline to take pictures from. The edge of the water is about 585 feet above sea level. The coastline has along its entire length a cliff that is about 633 feet above sea level. Here's a picture of part of the cliff. It's about 48 feet top to bottom. So, I've made some observations, I've gathered some information, and now it's time to make a guess. Well, my hypothesis is, since I can see a whole 8 mile stretch of lake that looks flat, my guess is that it's flat. Next step is to set up an experiment to test my hypothesis and make a prediction as to how my experiment will turn out. My experiment will be to take pictures of an object on one shore from the opposite shore from multiple angles and compare using precise measurements and data. If the water is flat, the object should be visible from any angle. Whether I'm right on the beach or on the cliff or swimming in the lake or parasailing, an object visible from one of these angles should be visible from any of the others. So, setting up my experiment, I chose two viewing spots on the south shore and some easily identifiable landmarks on the north shore, about six and a half miles away. I made observations of all these landmarks, but just to keep it brief, I want to focus on the Lighthouse Inn. From Google Earth, you can see that the shore of its lake-facing side is lined with rocks. This line of rocks is about 11 yards wide. It is also about 5 to 7 feet tall, and most importantly, it's about 20 yards in front of the hotel. It's not simply part of the hotel. These rocks are a separate physical entity altogether. As you can see, they reach at least 11 yards towards where I'll be taking my pictures, farther in most places. Here's some people sitting on the rocks, just to give you an idea of scale. Here's a fairly close-up picture I took of the hotel on another day, some time ago, which really shows that those are some serious rocks, easily visible from a short distance away. Here are the two angles I took my pictures from. The first angle is from the top of the cliff, and the second is from the edge of the lake, which is 48 feet lower, and also 57 yards closer to the other shore. So, what I did was first take about a dozen pictures from the top of the cliff, climb down this treacherous little path, and take another dozen or so pictures from the bottom. For the second set, I crouched down to get as low as possible, about three feet above the lake surface. Here's the camera I used, the Nikon P510 with 42x zoom. I know the P900 is all the rage for these kinds of experiments, but I like mine, and it turns out it was more than good enough. 
Here are some of the pictures I took from the top of the cliff. There you can see the North Shore. Here's the weather data in case one of you might find it useful. Here I zoomed in part way, and here I'm using the full 42x zoom. Here are some pictures I took from the bottom of the cliff, right by the lake. In all, the whole process from taking my first picture to my last took under 10 minutes. Now it's time to analyze my test results. Here are the pictures of those three landmarks, one from each angle. I've recorded the date, time, elevation, distance, zoom, temperature, and humidity. The only real difference here is the elevation, which is the difference of 48 feet. Everything else is about the same. Do you notice anything? In the first picture, we see rocks. In the second picture, we see no rocks. Here I place pictures of just the inn side by side from each angle with the tops of the buildings lined up. You can clearly see that the rocks are visible in one but not in the other. The next day I even drove down to the inn to take pictures of the rocks. As you can see, these are real boulders, yet they are clearly not visible from the lower angle. So, now we can present our conclusion. Lake Michigan is curved. Mm, wait, not yet. Part of science is applying doubt to your results and see if you can find another explanation. There are several to explore. First, was it the rising tide? Well, the tide in Lake Michigan does not rise 7 feet in 10 minutes. In fact, the most the tide ever rises in the Great Lakes is about 5 centimeters. The Great Lakes are, in fact, considered non-tidal, so no. Are they hidden by mist? Go back and look at the photos. That's not mist. That's blue liquid water. Nothing but lake. Atmospheric refraction or mirage? I don't know. The study of optics is pretty complicated. I did provide the temperature, date, time, humidity, pressure, and direction, so maybe that'll help me figure it out. What I've learned about refraction doesn't suggest that that's the answer, and doesn't look like most examples of refraction or mirages that I've seen, but please, uh, tell me what you think. Was it a mirage? I definitely don't think so. In fact, a mirage is merely a reflection, and I do happen to have a picture I took at the end which clearly shows a reflection. The pictures of my experiment do not look like this. Lens distortion? Nope. Lens distortion only changes the shape of objects. It doesn't make them disappear from sight. Too far away or not enough zoom? No. When an object is hidden from view by another object, zooming in will not bring it back. Also, smaller objects farther away, like the lighthouse in Sign, are clearly visible where the rocks are not. Photoshop? No, I did not use Photoshop. So, let's consider another model. Instead of the flat lake model, let's use the generally accepted model of a round-ish Earth with a radius of 3,959 miles. This figure tells us that from where you are standing, there will be an apparent drop of 8 inches per mile squared over the curve. With a curve measuring 6.4 miles, that gives us a 27-foot drop, which is more than enough to conceal the rocks behind the water of the lake. Even if I took into account the height of my camera above the ground, that still gives us more than enough to make the rocks invisible. Therefore, Lake Michigan is curved. Mm, wait, still not yet. This is only part of a much larger process. I should repeat the experiment several times in other conditions and continue to inquire, explore, and especially to share my results. I should invite criticism and skepticism from other observers. That's part of the scientific process. However, the good news is that millions of dedicated men and women have been observing, measuring, collecting data, and sharing results for thousands of years. The body of work that has been collected, refined, examined, and re-examined is astounding. As fun as it is to try on my own, for me to presume I could add or change anything significant with my limited means and experience would be vanity of the highest order. So thanks for watching. Uh, please subscribe, share, like, and all that. This will be my last science video for a while, I promise. Uh, real soon I'll be getting back to music videos, so if you're sick of all this science business and just want to listen to some music, that'll be coming up soon. So, thanks again for watching. See you next time.